Immanuel Kant, what matters is the motive. If you believe in universal human rights, you are probably not a utilitarian. If all human beings are worthy of respect, regardless of who they are or where they live, then it's wrong to treat them as mere instruments of the collective happiness. You might defend human rights on the grounds that your reason for respecting rights is not to respect the person who holds them, but to make things better for everyone. If rights do not rest on utility, then what is their moral basis? Libertarians offer a possible answer that persons should not be used merely as means to the welfare of others, because doing so violates the fundamental right of self-ownership. My life, my labor, and my person belong to me, and me alone, and they are not therefore at the disposal of the society as a whole. Immanuel Kant, born in 1724 and dying in 1804, offers an alternative account of duties and rights, one of the most powerful and influential accounts any philosopher has produced. And uh, given that even John Locke, 13, or 1632 to 1704, the great theorist of property rights and limited government, did not assert an unlimited right of self-possession. He, uh, he rejected the notion uh, that we may dispose of our life and liberty however we please, but Locke's theory of unalienable rights invoked God and thus possessed a problem for those who seek a moral basis for rights that does not rest on religious assumptions. However, Kant's account does not depend on the idea that we own ourselves, nor on the claim that our lives and liberties are a gift from God, but instead depend on the idea that we are rational beings worthy of dignity and respect. Kant was 31 when he received his first academic job as an unsalaried lecturer. He was a popular and industrious lecturer, giving about 20 lectures a week on subjects including logic, ethics, geography, and anthropology, as well as law and metaphysics. Um, so he gave probably around an average of four lectures a day. In 1781, at the age of 57, he published his first major book called The Critique of Pure Reason, which challenged the empiricist theory of knowledge associated with David Hume and John Locke. Five years after Jeremy Bentham's Principles of Morals and Legislation, published in 1780, Kant's Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals, published in 1785, launched a devastating critique of utilitarianism, and it argues that morality is not about maximizing happiness or any other end, but instead is about respecting persons as ends in themselves. Kant's groundwork for the metaphysics of morals appeared shortly after the American Revolution of 1776 and just before the French Revolution of 1789. In line with the moral thrust of those revolutions, it offers a powerful basis for what the 18th century revolutionaries called the rights of man and what we in the early 21st century call universal human rights. What is the supreme principle of morality? And what is freedom? Kant's emphasis on human dignity informs present-day notions of universal human rights. His account of freedom figures in many of our contemporary debates about justice. Kant rejects maximizing welfare and promoting virtue. Neither, of course, he thinks, respects human freedom. What we commonly think of as freedom of, or consumer choice is not true freedom, because it involves satisfying desires that we have not chosen in the first place. So, Kant rejects utilitarianism, trying to revive and derive moral principles from the desires we happen to have is the wrong way to think about morality. The mere fact that the majority, however big or small, favors a certain law, however intensely, does not make the law just. Morality cannot be based on interests, wants, desires, and preferences that people have at any given point in time in the whole entire history of human existence. These factors are variable and contingent 
and cannot serve as the basis for universal moral principles and as such as universal human rights. Kant did not base morality on divine authority. He argues, however, that he can and we can arrive at the supreme principle of morality through the existence of what Kant calls pure practical reason. Kant argues that every person is worthy of respect, not because we own ourselves, but because we are rational beings, capable of reason, beings, sentient beings, capable of acting and choosing freely. Kant does not mean that we always succeed in acting rationally or in choosing autonomously. Sometimes we do act rationally, and sometimes we do not. Kant recognizes that we are sentient creatures as well as rational ones. We respond to our senses, to our feelings, and that's what it means to be sentient. Our capacity for reason is bound up with our capacity for freedom. Taken together, these capacities make us distinctive and set us apart from mere objects of the physical realm or animal existence. They make us more than mere creatures of our appetites. Concerning Kant's notion of freedom, we are not acting freely, but are in actuality acting according to a determination given outside of us, to act heteronomously. Whenever my behavior is biologically determined or socially conditioned, it is not truly free. To act freely is to act autonomously. To act autonomously is to act according to a law that I give myself not according to the dictates of nature or social convention. So, to act freely is not to choose the best means to a given end, it is to choose the end itself, for its own sake, a choice that human beings can make, and one that most animals cannot. When we act heteronomously, we act for the sake of ends given outside of us. We are instruments, not authors, of the purpose we pursue. Respecting human dignity means, therefore, treating persons as ends in themselves, this is why it is wrong to use people for the sake of the general welfare, to treat people as instruments or objects, a means to the happiness of others. This raises the questions of what gives an action moral worth. The moral worth of an action consists not in the consequences that flow from the action, but in the intention from which the act is done. And therefore, what matters is the motive. The motive that confers moral worth on an action is the motive of duty, by which doing the right thing for the right reason. Kant is not yet saying what particular duties we have. But when we assess the moral worth of an action, we assess the motive from which it is done, not the consequences that it produces. If we act out of some motive other than duty, such as self-interest, our action lacks moral worth. This is true. For any and all attempts to satisfy our wants, desires, pre preferences, and appetites, Kant contrasts these motives, what he calls motives of inclination, with the motive of duty, and he insists that only actions done out of the motive of duty have moral worth. Kant acknowledges that it is often difficult, however, to know what motivates people to act as they do. In practice, duty and inclination often coexist. It is often hard to sort out one's own motives, let alone know for sure the motives of other people. But once we glimpse the motive of duty, we can then identify the feature of our good deeds that gives them their moral worth, namely their principle, not their consequences. What is the supreme principle of morality? If morality means acting from duty, it remains to be shown what duty requires. What then is the supreme principle of morality? Concerning Kant's answer, three big ideas, morality, freedom, and reason. We have three different kinds of contrasts. The first contrast is morality, which consists of duty versus inclination. The second contrast is that of freedom, which consists of autonomy and heteronomy. And the third contrast is reason, categorical versus hypothetical imperatives. We often think of freedom as has been said before, as being able to do what we want in order to pursue our desires un unimpeded. But Kant, however, possesses a powerful challenge to this way of thinking about freedom. If you did not choose those desires freely in the first place, how can you think of yourself as free when you are pursuing them? Kant captures this challenge in, in this contrast between autonomy and heteronomy. But this raises a difficult question. 
Is not everything I do motivated by some desire or inclination determined by outside influences? I offer the answer yes. But like the laws of physics, human beings are not exempt from the laws of nature. So, if we are capable of freedom, we must be capable of acting according to a law that we give ourselves. But where could such a law come from? Kant's answer is from reason. If reason determines will, then human will becomes the power to choose independent of the dictates of nature or inclination. Thomas Hobbes earlier called reason the scout for the desires. David Hume, a little bit later than Thomas Hobbes, but before Kant, called reason the slave of the passions. For Kant, reason is not just the slave of the passions. If that were all reason amounted to, we would be better off with instinct. Kant's idea of reason, of practical reason, the kind involved in morality, is not instrumental reason, but pure practical reason, which legislates a priori, regardless of all empirical ends. So Kant distinguishes two ways that reason can command the will. The hypothetical imperative. Hypothetical imperatives are used instrumental. Um, if you want X, then do Y. But Kant Kant contrasts hypothetical imperatives, with, which are always conditional, with an imperative that is unconditional, a categorical imperative. If an action would be good solely as a means to something else, Kant writes, the imperative is hypothetical. If the action is represented as good in itself, and therefore as necessary for a will of which itself accords with reason, then the imperative is categorical. By categorical, Kant here means unconditional. A categorical imperative is concerned not with the matter of the action and its presumed results, but with its form and with the principle from which it follows. And what is essentially good in the action consists in the mental disposition. Let the consequences be what they may. Only a categorical imperative can qualify as an imperative of morality, not a hypothetical imperative, of course. To be free requires that I act out of a categorical imperative. But what is the categorical imperative, and what does it command of us? Well, there are multiple formulas. There are different versions. The first version is categorical imperative 1, to universalize your maxim. The first version, the formula of the universal law. Act only on that maxim, whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. By maxim, a rule or principle that gives the reason for your action. In effect, act only on principles that we could universalize without contradiction. Seeing whether I could universalize the maxim of my action and continue acting on it is not a way of speculating about possible consequences. It is a test, however, to see whether my maxim accords with the categorical imperative. We do have a second version of the categorical imperative, categor categorical imperative 2, to treat persons as ends. The formula of humanity as an end. So categorical, categorical imperative 1 is the formula of the universal law. Categor, categorical imperative 2 is the formula of humanity as an end. We cannot base the moral law on any particular interest, purposes, or ends because it would be relative to the person whose ends they were. But suppose there were something whose existence has in itself an absolute value. Then in it, and it alone would be the ground of a possible categorical imperative. An absolute value as an end in itself? Humanity. I say that humanity, and in general every rational being, exists and exists as an end in itself, not merely as a means for arbitrary use by this or that will. Persons are rational beings. They have not only a relative value, but an absolute value, an intrinsic value, which is dignity. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. Consider, however, the duty to respect our fellow human beings. Self-respect and respect for other persons flow from one and the same principle. The duty of respect is a duty we owe to persons as rational beings, as bearers of humanity, it has nothing to do with who the person may be or where they are from. 
We love our spouses, for example, and the members of our family. We feel sympathy for people for whom we can identify. We feel solidarity with our friends and comrades. This, of course, is respect, but is, uh, but is not, but is not respect um, for humanity in general. Uh, it is respect uh, that we have emotionally. Uh, the Kantian respect is respect for humanity, for a rational capacity that resides in all of us. The principle of respect lends itself to the universal human rights. Uh, justice requires us to uphold the rights of all persons, regardless of where they live or how well we know them, because they are human beings capable of reason and therefore worthy of respect. Moral law consists, therefore, of a categorical imperative, a principle that requires us to treat persons with respect as ends in themselves. When I act, therefore, in accordance with the categorical imperative, I am acting freely. Whenever I act according to a hypothetical imperative, I act for the sake of some interest or end given outside of me. In that case, I am not really free. My will is determined not by me, but by outside forces, by the necessities of my circumstance, or by the wants and desires that I happen to have. What matters is not how you would feel under cer certain circumstances, but what it means to treat persons as rational beings worthy of respect. The dignity of humanity consists precisely in its capacity to make law, although only on condition of being itself also subject to the law it makes. Everything we do, therefore, can be described from a physical or biological point of view, but it can also be explained in terms of ideas and beliefs issuing from history and culture. We understand ourselves from both standpoints, the empirical realm of physics and biology and psychology, and an intelligible realm of human agency. Kant says that, quote, a rational being has two points of view from which it can regard itself and from which it can know laws governing all its actions. Consider first to be under laws of nature, heteronomy, and secondly, so far as we belong to the intelligible world, to be under laws which, being independent of nature, are not empirical but have their ground in reason alone, end quote. The contrast between these two perspectives lines up with the three contrasts we have discussed. Contrast one of morality, duty versus inclination. Contrast two of freedom, autonomy versus heteronomy. Contrast number three, reason, the categorical imperative versus the hypothetical imperative. And contrast four, standpoints, intelligible versus sensible realms. My actions are determined by the laws of nature and the regularities of cause and effect. This is the aspect of human action that physics, biology, and neuroscience can describe. And as rational beings, I inhabit an intelligible world. Here, being independent of the laws of nature, I am capable of autonomy, capable of acting according to the law I give myself. So the idea, therefore, of freedom makes me a member of the intelligible world. The idea we can act freely takes moral responsibility for our actions and holds other people morally responsible for their actions requires that we see ourselves from this perspective, from the standpoint of an agent, not merely that of an object. So we can resist this notion, however. We can claim that human freedom and moral responsibility are utter illusions. And although they are, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to understand ourselves, to make sense of our lives without a conception of freedom and morality. Again, morality is not empirical. It stands at a certain distance from the world. It passes judgment on the world. Science, therefore, cannot, for all its power and insight, reach moral questions because it operates within the sensible realm. Science can investigate nature and inquire into the empirical world, but it cannot answer moral questions. Morality and freedom are not empirical concepts. We cannot prove that they exist, but neither can we make sense of our lives without presupposing that they might exist. So, to sum up, Kant rejects utilitarianism, not only as a basis for personal morality, but also as a basis for law. As he sees it, a just con constitution aims at harmonizing each individual's freedom with that of everyone else. It has nothing to do with maximizing utility, but 
with the determination of basic rights. To base the Constitution on one particular conception of happiness, such as that of the majority or the minority, would therefore impose on some of the values of others. It would fail to respect the right of each person to pursue his or her own ends. Kant derives justice and rights from a social contract. Earlier thinkers, however, like Locke and Rousseau, included um, in their writings an, uh, an argument that legitimate government arises from a social contract among men and women who, at one time or another, decide among themselves on the principles that will govern their collective life. Kant sees the contract differently, however. Although legitimate government must be based on an original contract, we need by no means assume that this contract actually exists as a fact. The original contract is not actual, but imaginary. Historically, in the distant history of nations, moral principles cannot be derived from empirical facts alone. Just as the moral law can't rest on the interests or desires of individuals, principles of justice cannot rest on the interests or desires of a community. The mere fact that a group of people in the past have agreed to a constitution is not enough to make that constitution just. A practical reality, however, is to oblige every legis legislator to frame their laws in such a way that they could have been produced by the united will of a whole nation, however that may be, and oblige or obligate each citizen if, if they had consented. This imaginary act of collective consent is the test of the rightfulness of every public law. What this imaginary contract will look like, we don't know. Uh, what principles of justice it will produce is up for the future history of humanity to discover.